working on these essays over the next week here. So I've put together something that I'm hoping can help you visualize ways to organize your ideas. You know, all the details that you have, that you've got to structure into supporting ideas and paragraphs. And then how to make those paragraphs flow. So this slideshow, which is now available to you, is designed with that in mind. And it's broken up into a couple of sections. There are a bunch of slides that deal with the flow of ideas. And I've linked to exactly where you can find what you might need for the character, the angle that you're working on. And then suggested paragraph structures. And these suggested structures work for any of the topics. All right, they're pretty generic. You adapt them as you need them. But I've also put in this area that gets into the extensions. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to show you basically how this works and how to read what's on here. All right, I don't want to make this too lengthy, so I'm not going to go in depth into any one of the categories, but I'll highlight a bit about each. All right, so for example, this layout is the sort of thing you're going to see for each topic area. So dealing with the administration, personally, I think focusing just on Dr. Seymour makes a lot of sense because uh, there's so much that he does, so many actions he takes and distortions he puts out there that you can do a solid paper just looking at him. So the key flow of your ideas is you've got to cover their motive or goal, then the sort of things they do, and the impacts. This is where the extension comes in if you're doing that. All right. If you're not looking at the extension, you don't need to worry much about that. So here, right, protect the budget. And these are three categories that I see as areas where you could find enough evidence to build supporting ideas. The things in yellow on each side are potential supporting ideas that you can look at when you go to structure your paragraphs. So you can show that when people tell him the truth or he has the opportunity to hear the truth, he ignores it. You can show that he distorts things about Phil, certainly in the memo, lying about Narwin, etc. And then once you go through these things, you want to examine the major impacts. Did what this person did help them reach their goals? And beyond themselves, who did it help? Who did it hurt? That's how you can then make that moral statement that would become part of your thesis. All right. So as you'll see, I go through this for each character or each category. So here are actions from Dr. Seymour. Same sort of deal, right? You have the same goal, whether you're doing actions or lies and distortions, it's the same goal. And a lot of the evidence will overlap as well, but it's a matter of how you categorize it. So here, if you're looking at actions, he created a memo that was clearly not accurate. He arranged a meeting with Ted Griffin and then eventually signed off, apparently, on a plan to throw all the blame on the teacher. So those are three big areas you can look at. And then, of course, same thing with the goals. Ted Griffin. His motive is consistently to get elected. So if you're looking at categorizing the stuff as actions, you can look at how he manipulates people. Right? He does that with Jen Stewart. He does that with Mr. Seymour. You can look at how he gives inaccurate speeches, how he attacks the budget, distorts Phil's story. And keep in mind, he also flips those around. And it's not like you have to cover everything in yellow in your paper. I'm just trying to show you some categories. You could hit his stuff by focusing just on those speeches and showing how he flip-flops on issues. Goes from attacking the budget to supporting the budget, attacking the school to defending the school. Right? Um, there's plenty there to work with. And again, you got to look at the major impacts. Each of these people has impacts on Narwin, on how the school administration ends up going, how the school works, right? Whether or not they get their budget, you can connect all that stuff into these characters. Um, so those are his actions. Now, if you wanted to categorize it as lies, same basic scenes, right? You can show that he lies to a reporter to create a false story, that he then lies to the public in his speeches, that he lies to Dr. Seymour in that meeting. Right? Those are just some categories you could look at. So as you gather your evidence, you're trying to think of ways to group that evidence 
so that you have a supporting idea that can cover a couple examples. Right? So he lies to the public here and here. Now, two different lies in his speeches, whatever. And down here, same sort of thing, looking at the results. Right? Jake Barlow. Now, with the media, I think it makes sense to focus on one or the other. I think if you try to cover all of the media, you're going to open up a lot of avenues. It might be too much. But you can decide that after you gather your evidence. You can gather the evidence looking at Jake Barlow, Jen Stewart, uh, the AAP, and then see where the most of your evidence lies. But I've broken these slides up so you can look at one and then the other. So Jake Barlow, his goal is to gain listeners. And as I point out here, there's a lot of evidence you can find to show that that is absolutely his goal. He outright says it. And then for his actions, he dedicates his show to Phil's story. He stirs up emotions in his listeners and builds a crusade. Right? And that leads to some major impacts, all the letters that come in and the postcards. And he really turns the public against things. Right? So does he reach his goal? All right. But is it for the greater good? When you look at it in balance, is what he did a good thing? Does it help or harm more people? Was it to help others or was it selfish? Those are the sorts of things. For truth with him, if you're going after that angle, you can show that he repeats distortions he heard otherwhere in other spots, like from the article. Doesn't bother to check facts. Right? He adds emotion and bias by making things riled up with the word choices he uses to describe people. Uh, and he hears and reports only one side, right? He hangs up on the guy who goes after the other side. And those, in turn, lead to the impacts that you could discuss if you're going that route. Jen Stewart. Now, hers I've combined here because um, you've got a narrow focus where her evidence and analysis really comes in. And her goal is a little more subtle in proving it because she never comes out and says she's trying to sell papers. So if you're doing hers, odds are you're going to have a briefer part about her goal where you talk about how the goal of the media as a whole is to sell papers and gain readers. Now, on the flip side, there's a ton of proof for whether or not she reaches her goal. You can show all the people that read it, all the people that talk about it, how it goes to the wire services and gets picked up by Jake Barlow. Clearly, her story sells. So either way, what I see as the major things you can talk about are how she deals with her interviews, that she asks leading questions and only hears what she wants to hear, and then she publishes an inaccurate article. And even in that, that can become two supporting ideas, that she has incorrect details and that she uses words designed to make her audience feel a certain way, that she has bias in what she says. And then, of course, the impact. Um, now to Phil Malloy. Motive and goal. Keep in mind, his goal is to improve his grades to get on the track team, if, that's, if you're looking at the big picture. Right? That's one way to parse it out so that you can really attack everything he does. And remember... You've got to talk about stuff late in the book as well. So it can't just be his early stuff. So you can show that he's given choices on how to meet his goal, but he ignores the good ones, then gets into that whole big mess, right, and takes actions, and then ultimately goes back to those original choices he was given, but it's too late. And then for major impacts, of course, he leads into everything that goes on. So you can really show not just how it messes up his goals, but how it messed up everything from the school budget, right? Um, arguably, he helped get Ted Griffin elected. I mean, there's a mixed bag here. He does a lot of stuff from his little I don't want to be in that class thing, All right? If you're looking at truth, now you get some directions you can pick, depending on how you gather your evidence and what sort of evidence you have. Same goal, but you can categorize it according to things he lies about, right? Like a couple good supporting ideas there, lies about Narwhal, lies about patriotism. Or you can look at who he lies to and categorize that way. Right? And those are just a couple options. Um, so you can think about that based on your evidence, how you want to categorize those. And then, of course, the same stuff here. 
And then lastly, Mr. Malloy, he's a more complicated case, all right, because overall he's trying to fix his own mistakes through his kid. We've talked about how he wants to make sure his son is on the track team because his wife says uh, Phil is not doing track to get back at him for not being supportive. And you also have his whole background of failing at being the track star. And he fails to stand up for himself at work. So he has two big failures. So on one side, he pushes Phil to be on the track team and then blindly supports his son. Right? Doesn't even want to hear the other side of stuff. Same thing over here. He pushes Phil to not take it anymore, to stand up. And he takes Phil to talk to the reporter and Ted Griffin. So those are two paths you could look at that all lead to the major impacts he experiences and what doesn't work out well for Phil or his own goals, ultimately. When looking at the truth, same sort of thing, only as you can see here, these are now in terms of ways he doesn't hear the truth or distorts what he does hear. All right? That works as well. And these are categories, again, for you to consider if this is the person you're pursuing. All right. So now, suggested paragraph structures. What I've got here is the one that you've already seen in the guidelines, where your first paragraph, you hammer out what the goal is and how that leads to some early actions. SIP A focuses on the goal. SIP B focuses on those early actions or early distortions. And I give some descriptors here about this. Remember, your argument should flow from one to the next. So if you do that in your first paragraph, then in your second paragraph, you can look at later actions or later distortions and two major categories. And again, when you're looking at categories with the supporting ideas on these slides, think about the things I had in yellow on the earlier slides. Those are logical ways to group your evidence so that you can pair them up to make good, strong points. And again, if you're doing the lies thing, I give a little more info over here. And remember, you've got to prove it's not true. Proving a lie takes two pieces of evidence. The thing you say is a lie and the thing that proves it's not true. Suggested structure B is a more simplified structure where your first paragraph focuses on the goal, prove that this is their objective, and then the second paragraph focuses on the actions or distortions they engage in to meet the goal. That's it. Very straightforward. What if you're doing the extension? So as I point out here, the extension ends up driving the whole structure because it becomes part of your thesis statement. All right. You want to show that the author is sending a message through this character, that through Mr. Malloy, uh, Avi demonstrates that lying, that distorting the truth does not justify one's actions or something like that. All right, that was awkwardly worded. That's okay. It's your job, not mine. Uh, so that's what I spell out here. And then I give you a couple of options for how to incorporate that. All right, your first body paragraph will still look like the ones I've shown for body paragraph one in either of the structures, all right? The second paragraph is where you can do this sort of thing. And I put this in the earlier guiding document. All right? You have a major action or lie category here, and you prove it. And then in SIP B, you go into the impacts. And the key is you want to connect whatever actions or lies you've talked about earlier in your paper to the final results. So whether or not it got the person to reach their goals and how it affected someone else. Those are the two things you want to hit. So Stewie 1 would be themselves, Stewie 2 would be how it affected others. The other option you have is just follow that earlier paragraph structure, you know, suggestion A there for your first two body paragraphs, and then you could do, if you wanted, a third paragraph focusing on the results. All right, where SIP A is their own goals, and SIP B is how it affects others. All right? So that's how I would look at these things. So take your time to go through this. I hope you find these slides helpful. If you have questions, please post them in our discussion area for the literary analysis so others can benefit from the discussion as well. 
All right, don't forget, I'm available for extra help during office hours on your remote days from 11.30 to 12 o'clock. You can also stop by, obviously, when you're in school because we're going to be working on this in class. So you are welcome to conference with me on the in-class days this coming week. Have a good weekend.